Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Antimicrobial Interventions in the Food Industry. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law since the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is tired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Daryl will discuss food safety challenges, what are interventions, sources of contamination, pre-harvest interventions, hide interventions, importance of prerequisite multiple hurdle concepts. To give you a little background about our presenter, Darryl, Dr. Daryl Suderman, President of Food Technology, Technical Consulting, has worked for food manufacturing and leading restaurant chains for more than 20 years. For the last seven years, Dr. Suderman has served as an expert witness consultant for both plaintiffs and defense attorneys throughout the United States. Dr. Suderman received his BS and MS degrees in agricultural education and his PhD in food science from Kansas State University. He holds three U.S. patents, co-authored a food processing book, and has worked, written over 40 peer-reviewed and trade magazine articles and white papers. He has worked in research and development, quality assurance, and food safety for many of the leading restaurant chains, including KFC, Boston Market, Church's Chicken, Quiznos, Captain D's, Chick-fil-A, and Wendy's International. In addition, Dr. Suderman co-founded Business IQ LLC as Business Intelligence IT Consulting Company, which has been accepted as an official partner of SAP Software Company. Attendees who require passcode, the word for today is intervention. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You are also required to complete a survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, you will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and, and Daryl, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you. This is Daryl Suderman, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, talk with you today about an important uh, topic within the food industry. Uh, just to bring it into real life terms, uh, I want to explain and give a little story on what interventions are really all about from a human standpoint. Um, as I was kind of putting this preparation together, I thought about my uh, neighbor boy who's 15 years old, lives right across the street from where my house is, and uh, on November 11th, he was um, diagnosed with Burkett's lymphoma, and uh, it's a non-Hodgkin's type, but it is uh, so rapid growing that it can be the size of a grape, a lymph node, and in two or three days, the size of an orange. So needless to say, uh, he immediately uh, was submitted to a hospital and uh, provided with um, um, chemotherapy. And I thought, you know, the chemotherapy is, is an intervention. And what we're going to be talking about today is interventions as they apply to food and plants, uh, versus uh, someone who has cancer and has to take chemotherapy or other type of drugs. So anything that a hospital would do for a human would be an intervention. And what we are going to be talking about today is applies to food, uh, meat, uh, poultry, produce, and that kind of thing. So that gives you kind of a little bit of a perspective on uh, what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, the interesting part about it is, is that uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, their Food uh, Safety Inspection Service, has actually uh, written out and charted uh, all the uh, interventions that can be applied safely to the uh, U.S. food supply. So uh, we'll talk about, you know, some of the more recent ones and uh, as we go along through the presentation today. 
And I would also add that uh, be sure that uh, you, you write some notes down and uh, that could be asked in the form of a question. We're going to have question and answer time about halfway through this presentation and then at the end also. Uh, I won't go through um, uh, any more about my background because you've heard it once before from Rochelle. Um, I have listed here a couple papers that I have written uh, both for TASA and Trial Lawyer Magazine. Uh, the first one is Protecting the Food and Beverage Recipe and Process Ownership. I think that was my first paper that I uh, wrote for TASA, and it had to do with uh, content of uh, patents and patent uh, securing patents. And then the second one was Emerging Issues in Food Product Litigation. Um, the, the third was Top 5 Consumer Liability Risks the Public Ignores. And uh, the fourth one that I have listed here is uh, the public safety liability for mobile food retailers and quick serve restaurants. And that was published in Trial Lawyer magazine back in the 2011. So uh, if any of these have any interest to in you, you can certainly Google them and, uh, and, and print them out. But uh, uh, it's in interesting to note that uh, the, the whole food truck uh, phenomena is continuing to grow. And um, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I live in the state of Colorado to see uh, food trucks that sell marijuana products uh, because that's such a rapidly growing business, uh, not just in Colorado, but throughout the United States and Canada. And um, so that's some of the presentations that I've had. Uh, there are several food safety challenges and um, I think it's important to understand exactly uh, where this contamination and these uh, pathogen organisms, pathogen meaning organisms that cause people to get sick or uh, severely sick or even die, uh, but uh, food grains uh, are a source of these pathogens. And uh, the reason that I've listed food grains is because they um, uh, get contaminated with the dust of the fields and uh, and through the harvesting and repeated uh, uh, tilling of the soil um, where these organisms will live um, in the soil and uh, become uh, um, some bad actors as, as time goes on. Uh, livestock and produce uh, is uh, filled with dirt that grows in the ground. Uh, it blows throughout the air, and then you have the whole issue of uh, wild animals versus uh, domesticated animals. And uh, insects, rodents can carry these pathogens around, and um, uh, we're, what we're really concerned about is intestinal contents and the exterior of the animal, which is the hide. Interventions are needed to ensure that we are producing a safe food supply. So what is, again, what is the definition for uh, intervention in the food industry? Uh, it is the chemical or physical process or technology that when applied uh, effectively reduces or eliminates pathogenic microorganisms form a product, a process, or equipment service. So. Uh, when you're working on a particular case, uh, it's very important in, in uh, these intervention cases that uh, you ask for and receive a copy of the HACCP plan that um, uh, the company is using or was using when they um, ran into uh, um, a lawsuit situation or um, the federal government uh, inspector noticing something that was wrong. Um, you're going to, we're going to find out as we go through the, the discussion today how um, um, prerequisites are a part of this and uh, interventions and uh, how the HACCP program is uh, divided into two parts. One is hazard analysis 
which is commonly uh, denoted by H, capital H and an A, and then the CCP, which is a critical control point. So um, the hazard analysis uh, contains several critical control points, and it's always worth it in uh, doing the pre-investigations study and writing a report that um, these uh, locations of the critical control points, the layout of the HACCP plan, whether it's including every aspect that uh, one might think of, uh, these are all important uh, points to consider and to ask questions about. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about prerequisites. But again, uh, an intervention is any chemical or physical process or technology that when applied effectively reduces or eliminates pathogenic microorganisms from product, process, or equipment service. And then the last point I have here is a list of approved substances that can be found in the uh, food service or food safety inspection service directive number 7120.1. This is definitely uh, a document. It's about 128 pages long that you get your hands on and you keep it as a quick reference when you're working on food uh, uh, cases. Uh, but what it'll do is it'll tell you the substance, and uh, if you print it out now, it's dated January 19th, 2018, so it's very, very current, and uh, it will tell you what substances, uh, whether it's acetic acid or paracetic acid, uh, what chemicals can be used and are allowed for use on food products uh, by the government. And um, so that is... Um, uh, well worth having, and uh, it's something that I use. It's a reference Bible, so to speak, and uh, make sure that you can um, you get a hold of that. What are some sources of contamination? Uh, well, in uh, in the food world that I live in, um, uh, there's a term that's often used. It's called supply chain. And what that means is uh, the beginning of supply chain, let's say in a poultry operation, uh, that would be uh, the laying of an egg, and then uh, feeding of the chickens, um, hatching the egg, uh, sh shipping them to a broiler grow out house location. And uh, so that's that's what we call supply chain in uh, in the food processing industry. Um, one one source is the environment, or the farm or processing facility. Uh, uh, that would include on-farm handling, uh, the transportation, the pre-slaughter handling, and um, uh, that it could even, uh, I mentioned pre-slaughter handling, and one thing that comes to mind is uh, a professor at uh, Colorado State University, not far from where I live, uh, I think her name is Teton, um, but anyhow, she's the world known as far as uh, uh, animal uh, behavior and uh, making sure that animals are treated properly before they go into the slaughter uh, chute. Um, and then uh, we have the whole slaughter process and the carcass handling. Uh, there are seasonal differences that need to be considered, such as uh, uh, higher prevalence of, uh, of pathogens in a warm season or whether in a winter season or wetter season, not necessarily winter, but in a wetter season. And the cleanliness of the hide has a huge effect on the final product of food safety. And we'll see how, you know, the washing of the animals is so important. Uh, I've We'll show you four different uh, food safety challenges. The first is processing beef, you'll notice the feed yard with the, the beef ant, or the cows uh, in, in this uh, muddy lot. Uh, they roll in it, they dump in it, they play in it, and uh, all of that dirt needs to come off the carcass one way or the other. And the more you can clean it up before they get into the slaughtering barn, uh, the better off you could be. On the right-hand side, you see uh, beef carcasses hanging in the chill room, and uh, 
they've been uh, cleaned and washed and uh, and where sometimes uh, interventions will be apply, they'll spray different organic acids or different other products onto that whole carcass to keep um, uh, the meat as sanitary as, as possible and hopefully completely sanitary and free from uh, any pathogens of any sort. The second um, uh, area that I wanted to uh, show you was uh, case study number two, which is uh, processing uh, pork. And uh, again, it's a very similar situation to from the beef pictures that I showed you. Uh, you have the, the uh, pigs or the hogs on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, they're in a, um, a dirty lot. Sometimes they're in muddy lots. Uh, it just depends upon whether they're grown by a, a large um, pork company or whether they're individual people that just have uh, maybe 20 or 30 hogs, um, like I did when I was uh, going through college. Oh, boy. I'm not able to switch, let's see. Okay, this is the third uh, study. I probably have spent more time uh, in uh, poultry processing plants than uh, beef or pork or, or uh, produce. But uh, again, uh, the picture on the left shows a, a free range of uh, uh, boilers that are uh, growing and ready to be harvested. And uh, one thing about poultry is that it seems to have a great affinity for E. coli. Um, it, it's just E. coli and uh, chicken go together. Uh, they get, they lay in the dirt, they wash themselves with dirt, and uh, somehow or other we've got to figure out how to get uh, the product washed, clean, the carcasses sanitized, as you can see, these uh, gentlemen on the right-hand side is uh, uh, inspecting the carcasses as they go down the uh, production line in a poultry processing plant. I like this picture because it gives a, kind of a close-up shot of uh, processing produce. Again, uh, it's not a living animal, but it's a um, uh, plant that's growing in dirt uh, in big fields, it can be contaminated by uh, birds flying above the field and uh, uh, crapping on the, the plants and the, that are down below. Uh, it's virtually impossible, even if you can clean the exterior of uh, plants, whether that be carrots in this situation or squash or, or uh, peppers that the picture shows. Uh, one thing that some people may not understand or realize is that uh, the E. coli pathogen uh, can be drawn up into the inside of the plant uh, after it gets, uh, floats around in the irrigation water. So when the plant drinks water from the irrigation wells, uh, it can have that E. coli in the water and it goes on inside the plant. So uh, you may you're not necessarily in the clear when you go to uh, a grocery store like Kroger's or uh, Costco or Sam's Club uh, because um, there could be E. coli in the center of the, of the produce uh, just because it's very difficult to wash that out and to correct that situation. What are some uh, pre-harvest interventions? So what we're going to do now is start to look at uh, uh, how can we begin to minimize or eliminate uh, some of these food pathogens? And uh, strangely enough, uh, one of the ways is uh, to provide vaccinations. It's like uh, vaccinating uh, a chicken or, or a pig or something like that. Uh, we have already, uh, the, from an industry standpoint, uh, E. coli, uh, vaccine. We have a salmonella vaccine. 
um, intervention uh, uh, components can be added to feed additives. And after the diet prior to shipping and slaughter, um, probiotic added to the diet prior to slaughter. Uh, so vaccinations is a, is a big source of help. Um, sometimes a company may decide that they uh, are not interested um, in using vaccines. So uh, what they're going to have to do is find other ways to, to kill the pathogens, and we'll go through some of those. But this is just one option here. Another thing as an attorney, uh, if you're working a case uh, in like this, um, it's also uh, kind of worth noting and, and do a little research to find out, uh, does uh, the uh, veterinary that's on site at a food processing company, does he get a commission or is he, can he be tainted uh, by the type of vaccine that uh, the animals are given. Uh, it, it, it's kind of the same system that uh, you go to uh, Petco and you take your uh, pets in there to get a vaccination. Uh, they get a, uh, the veterinary will get a, um, uh, some cut on that. And, uh, you know, same way with drugs with humans when they go see their regular doctor. So, uh, just point out a few things to keep your uh, eyes open uh, to, so you can uh, determine cause and intent uh, for those applications. And then there's water treatments. Uh, they can be somewhat cost, uh, costly. Um, there's other locations such as California where uh, water applications uh, could be expensive from the standpoint is that the cost of water uh, can be expensive because there's a lot of gallons of water that are required to wash poultry. I know that early in my career when I was doing some work in California on the olive industry, processing industry, and there and in, uh, in Spain, that um, uh, it's important to, uh, we were using something like nine gallons of water per, per uh, gallon of olives. So, uh, agriculture industry is a big user of olives and, or uh, water, and uh, it's costly. Uh, less effective usually target specific pathogens like E. coli that I have mentioned here, uh, 0157H7, uh, and it could lead to some resistance there. Uh, when we go to hide interventions, uh, the muscle of a healthy animal is sterile. It has natural barriers such as the skin or the hide and uh, has walls of digestive and respiratory tracts. What are the importance of, of uh, prerequisites? And uh, I mentioned uh, the term prerequisites before, um, but they are programs that um, uh, are designed to enhance and to strengthen and make more effective the HACCP plan that you have, that a processor has within his production plan. Uh, I'll give you five different examples of prerequisite programs. Uh, one is uh, good manufacturing practices. Uh, a lot of you have heard of that term before. Another one is sanitation and maintenance. Uh, another um, term for that is uh, Standard Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures, or SSOPs, and uh, the Pest Control Program, uh, Raw Material Control, and Production Control. And uh, I've used all of these. Uh, I've been a plant auditor myself, and when I worked at uh, Church's Chicken, um, I oversaw a team of people that monitored um, uh, chicken processing plants in 20 different locations. So I've been around that. And so that's really what uh, we mean by prerequisites, that you have to have uh, programs in place that uh, alert uh, people to uh, critical issues that come along during the production or processing of uh, animals and produce. Uh, sanitary dressing procedures, uh, 
are still very way much uh, important and should be followed in all the facilities. The effectiveness of these prerequisite programs must be ensured and revised if necessary. However, these programs cannot alone provide the needed food san safety sanitation protection. And that's what I uh, was referring to before. You, you can have these programs and you want to make sure that you uh, are working with an expert witness that is digging that information up. And uh, But you also need to look at finding out what kind of interventions are being used and do they meet the need or the, or the uh, safety requirement that uh, uh, is needed. Here's some uh, more information on the importance of prerequisites. Uh, remember, this is usually paper documents. The contamination of the carcass can occur within the processing facility as well. Um, through equipment, employees, air, water, um, and uh, equipment that could be uh, cutting knives. Uh, and I think uh, something that I failed to mention earlier uh, when we're talking about equipment, it brought to mind um, that one of the uh, biggest areas of research by college professors in the United States right now is researching uh, E. coli in the glands of animals. And it's kind of the same as um, the uh, E. coli getting up into the uh, stem of, uh, of a lettuce plant or something. The same thing they're starting to see is having the same effect in uh, beef animals and sheep and um, pigs is it getting in their glands and there's no way you can wash that from the outside edge. So it may be in those situations where they're going to have to use uh, vaccinations as a part uh, treatment um, for interventions. So your GMPs and SSOPs should address these as much as possible. Uh, proper SSOP before, during, and after, and proper hand washing techniques um, are important also. GMPs on a slaughter floor uh, is a definite requirement uh, just because um, uh, it's on the slaughter floor, the uh, interior bowels of the animal are being uh, uh, brought out, and uh, you want to make sure that uh, nothing breaks and contaminates the carcass uh, that was clean uh, before they started uh, opening up the, the animal. Uh, the multiple hurdle concept is, is the best situation in this situation as you go from uh, uh, one pathogen hurdle to another to another, the more you can build up that address that particular need, or the more the better. Uh, just a little information, a uh, little more discussion on this uh, multiple hurdle concept. Uh, the, the idea here is to place barriers in front of microorganisms so that they are less likely to make their way into the final product. Uh, such as antimicrobial uh, interventions. Uh, another is a firewall concept. Another one is a zero tolerance for fecal con contamination implemented in 1993. Um, so uh, once you have the tools, the um, antibacterial uh, vaccinations or washing or carcass washing or dipping, uh, then uh, you need to line that up and uh, build your firewall or build your multiple hurdle concept so that uh, as the bugs hit one, they so to speak, symbolically, uh, they get killed. And uh, if there's anything falling up or anything that got slipped through, it can be killed a second on the second or third hurdle. And that's kind of what we uh, talk about at hurdles in the food industry. Um, now we move on to the hide interventions. Uh, the hide on wash uh, is a high pressure washer, um, fairly high temperature, and the antimicrobial compounds are applied to the hide in a wash cabinet. Um, in that wash cabinet, uh, there's the opportunity to uh, use various antimicrobial agents. 
and I've listed a few here. One is chlorine, very common in uh, in the meat industry, um, and I guess you know the the produce industry too. And um, high bromus, uh, acid, sodium tri trisodium phosphate (TSP), chloroform, uh, phosphoric acid, lactic acid, and acetic acid. So. Uh, what we're seeing in the food industry is uh, widespread use of um, uh, organic acids and uh, the uh, FSIS directive that I mentioned before um, lists the things that can be used and government is very specific about what level of, of use that they can be. So uh, that's another advantage they, they give for that. Another is the dehairing uh, chemical. It could be chemical applied or costly hide, most valuable offal, not proven at line speeds and waste disposal issues uh, with the dehairing. So there's the hide, there's the hair that's got to come off, and um, even worse than uh, cattle or pigs is a uh, process that. Uh, Poultry has to go when the feathers are removed. Uh, it is um, very highly uh, loaded with uh, pathogen bacteria, and um, uh, you have to set the water temperature as uh, close as possible uh, so that it doesn't um, uh, deface the, the, the skin or take more than just the uh, uh, poultry skin off. Uh, here's some uh, list of um, carcass interventions. Uh, after we get the uh, um, hair and the hide trimmed back, uh, knife trimming uh, is one method. Uh, steam vacuuming, uh, where we target the hide opening pattern. Uh, organic acid sprays, as I mentioned before. Hot water, often been shown to reduce bacterial loads and uh, more effectively than uh, organic acids. Uh, steam pasteurization, carcass trimming uh, is used uh, as a part of the slaughter process. Final training, which is required, CCP must zero uh, the tolerance equipment, focus on the hide opening patterns, adjust only the visible compensation but usually um, uh, committed to uh, different levels. Uh, continuation of carcass interventions, and this is uh, pretty pretty common, as I mentioned before, the lactic acid rinse. Um, use warm carcass wash prior to uh, applying uh, uh, the lactic acid. The maximum concentration is 2.5%, typically used at 2%, and can be um, uh, applied at ambient temperature of 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It performs better when applied at a higher temperature, but uh, do not apply it to temperature over 130, or the lactic acid will evaporate out. Now, this is um, uh, something to be aware of in, in this particular situation. When it mentions uh, the lactic acid evaporating out, uh, some of these organic acids have what they call a, a shelf life, uh, so to speak, and um, you have to keep uh, the lactic acid solution fresh that is being sprayed or dipped onto uh, the, uh, the animal's carcass in its parts because it loses effectiveness in just, you know, almost a matter of seconds. And so it has to be continually refreshed. Otherwise, it's going to be ineffective. Uh, I mentioned uh, lactic acid. Acetic acid is another approved rinse by the uh, federal government in our country. Uh, here you use a warm carcass wash prior to applying the acetic acid. Uh, suggested solution concentration of 2%, which is exactly the same as what we 
recommended for the lactic acid. Uh, suggested solution concentration um, is the same, can be used, can use distilled white vinegar, uh, usually 5%, um, but it varies. Uh, one of the problems with vinegar is that it can be a, an effective change agent, kill agent, so to speak. Uh, but it leaves an off flavor vinegar off flavor in the in the meat sometimes, so um, that's to be avoided as much as possible, and that's one reason that it's not used as much. Uh, it can be applied at, at ambient temperature 130 degrees, just like the acetic acid, and it performs better when applied to a higher temperature. And do not apply a temperature above 130, or it'll again evaporate out. Now. One of the things that uh, it's worth pointing out is that when people use these um, chemical interventions um, and they uh, dissipate within a short amount of time, uh, they're considered to be um, processing aids. And so the government doesn't require that you put, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge anyhow, the um, uh, list vinegar or whatever, on your ingredient statement, and maybe you can, but a lot of times it disappears uh, so fast that uh, the government just allows it to be called a, um, a processing aid. Then you have a, a hot water wash or rinse, which isn't quite as effective, but the temperature here is about 30 degrees more to up to 150 to 180, and you check the temperature at a point of control. The higher the temperature, the greater the antimicrobial effect. Uh, be aware of worker safety with hot water, and then uh, condensation can be an issue with hot water. Um, steam pasteurization is another um, practice I've seen uh, used in beef processing plants. Uh, the carcass is placed in a chamber and the steam is applied, uh, rapidly raises the temperature of the carcass surface and uh, the carcass surface temperature is then quickly uh, lowered after that. So it's given a very, very brief exposure. We're at a break now um, where we can ask uh, questions. So, Rochelle, if you want to uh, see if there's any questions, uh, I'll uh, sure. respond appropriately. Um, if all the attendees can enter in the passcode for today, which is intervention, you can enter that in the Q&A widget. Um, also, any questions that you may have for Daryl. Our first question is, do you believe the regulations for slaughter processing are effective as we see more and more cases of animal abuse? I think um, the slaughter, you know, the processes that are in place or available for processors uh, are effective, but uh, it still gets down to how faithfully the processor uses them in the processing plant. And um, it's like um, uh, the government can uh, require, uh, you know, different uh, procedures for uh, uh, managing uh, cattle and, and other livestock that are um, going to slaughter. Um, but if people don't take the, the effort to monitor that and to um, uh, manage that, it, it doesn't do any good. And um, I am surprised as, you know, to compare that to uh, different cases that I've worked on. And I find that uh, processors uh, totally ignored different uh, critical control points, as we mentioned, in a HACCP program, and they, they act dumb or they, they've never heard of that before. Um, I think that's the sad part of it is, is that people just don't uh, um, use common sense and, and take the effort to, to do what's right. Question. Are organisms that receive the noted vaccines considered to be genetically modified? Uh, that's a good question. I haven't heard anything at all on that issue. Uh, not at all. Uh, I would say if they haven't reproduced into a different type of organism, 
or uh, or ends up creating new appendages, so to speak, uh, uh, that it wouldn't be. Uh, but that is, that's a good question. Uh, never have heard that um, mentioned before. Thanks, Sarah. You can continue with the presentation. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Trying to advance it. Here we go. Uh, second part of our webinar will cover trim interventions, non-intact interventions, ready to eat RTA is always going to be ready to eat meat products or ready to eat interventions and further processing interventions and bacteriophage interventions. Uh, some types of interventions that we haven't mentioned before and once we get done with this you'll have a very broad overview of just everything that's available uh, from an intervention standpoint. When we talk about trim interventions, uh, that's meat what we call meat trim or uh, further ground uh, meat or cut up meat or tenderized meat, the main concern is E. coli and uh, what they call um, uh, non uh, 00157 STEC. Um, the EC stands for um, E. coli and um, and uh, the other is the type of phage uh, that it is. But there's a bacterial load of incoming products should be addressed. Uh, more data on the prevention of 0157-.H7, but more and more research is being focused on the non-0157 STEC. Uh, will the interventions that work for one work on the non um, E. coli, um, you know, that's a great question and that's something that uh, a lot of universities and research facilities are trying to figure out right now as we go. Um, trim interventions versus what we were talking about is the carcass interventions. Um, the first we talk about is lactic acid. Uh, it can be uh, sprayed on a uh, chicken carcass, so to speak, or dipped. Uh, there is a dwell time required, as I mentioned before, so that the uh, chemical can uh, uh, be effective and kill the organisms, the pathogens that are uh, in the available. Then there's acidified sodium chloride, um, ASC, and then I have the brand name of the, the product itself that you can look up if you want. But it uh, can be applied either as a spray or a dip. It can be produced uh, with some, it creates some discoloration and off flavor in the higher levels of dwell time. Then uh, UV light is used at times. It's affected by the temperature, pH, and relative humidity. The lethal effect varies with intensity and length. If using a lower intensity, the exposure will need to be longer. And a lot of times where UV lights are used in a uh, beef or poultry or processing plant are in what they call the marination area where they're injecting the flavor marinade into the meat, into the center of the meat. And um, UV lights uh, are, are used in that situation probably more often than in other uh, applications. What are some of the best practices? Obviously, uh, you want to obtain raw materials. And I'm talking about meat lots from reputable sources and track and train unacceptable materials from suppliers. And uh, to explain a little bit more in detail, what I have in mind there is that uh, I've worked in uh, poultry processing plants and uh, beef, and what I, they'll order and buy from a competitor or another company that's just down the road close by, uh, meat or chicken, uh, so they can fill 
up an order and finish the processing. And so when you do that, you're buying from outside your own company and uh, you want to make sure that uh, it is clean and sterile. Uh, and so a lot of times you're going to have to take, instead of uh, just requesting a certificate of analysis, you're going to have to uh, ask them for uh, the lab results for microbiology growth uh, within that shipment so that it doesn't contaminate uh, your product and uh, meat products that you're trying to sell to your customers. Then grinding operations are another uh, best practice. Uh, they rely upon purchase spec programs and testing data for support decisions to make uh, uh, E. coli hazard reasonably likely to occur. The grinding operations oftentimes require certificate analysis for each shipment stating that it has been tested for E. coli and the result was negative. And that's just what I was mentioning. It should also require that the suppliers to provide documented proof uh, that their system is validated um, to reduce the uh, likelihood of E. coli. Some non-intact product interventions include blade tenderization. This is talking about tenderizer blade, uh, similar to what uh, uh, I grew up and maybe some of you grew up um, uh, ordering meat from a store and uh, you had um, uh, tenderized the, the, the steak or something by running it through a, a tender, a metal tenderizer. Uh, many suppliers don't test intact products that they are selling to facilities that will then produce a non-intact product from that raw material. Uh, verification activities include uh, the equip uh, required and very important uh, auditing or purchasing establishment by a third party. And that's just, again, one way to protect yourself is uh, to hire people. Uh, and there's a lot of them out there that do this. It's kind of a cottage industry to its own that um, uh, they're purchasing uh, safe and uh, pathogen-free uh, food. Uh, other, uh, some of the uh, RTE product interventions that I mentioned earlier in our presentation today uh, which means ready to eat products. Some interventions are uh, knife trimming, uh, the application of antimicrobial solutions to raw materials, uh, the treating uh, of brine solutions with UV light or filtration, uh, adding inhibitory substances to the brine, uh, intervention applied to the final product of the packaging material. Uh, we're also concerned with Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, Listeria monocytogenes, uh, environmental pathogen, it's ubiquitous, means it's, it can be anywhere uh, within a food processing plant. Uh, what makes it so dangerous is that it's uh, very cold stable, loves cold temperatures, which most uh, processing plants in the cut up berries are around 41 degrees or lower. And uh, so it uh, loves to grow in that environment, and therefore um, uh, it's trying to grow while you're trying to kill it. And uh, it just takes um, proper application of the uh, treatments uh, and the chemical interventions that you have lined up for that. There's some of the uh, USDA regulatory requirements. They can be found in uh, Title IX, Code of Federal Regulations 430.4. The final rule established in June of 2003 uh, states that a plant or an operator must control for listeria monocytogenes in HACCP plan and without SSOPs. Um, if control is thorough, um, SSOP and not as a CCP and it has a plan, you must have supporting documentation staying why listeria monocytogene hazard is not reasonably likely to occur. Um, it must comply with requirements in one of the three alternatives, 
Alternative one is post-lethality treatment. Um, alternative two is post-lethality and or um, antimicrobial agent and process. And the third is the sanitation program. Some of the regulatory requirements uh, that are um, found in this uh, CFR 430. Uh, Post-lethality treatment, um, it's applied in the final product or sealed packaging of product to reduce and eliminate the microorganisms on the product uh, through the packaging, through the distribution of product to the customer. It must identify uh, Listeria monocytogenes as a hazard reasonably likely to occur. The point of treatment as a CCP or critical control point. Um, another thing, I ran into a situation uh, fairly recently where um, the micro, uh, the HACCP program had to have a uh, kind of what they call a salmonella HACCP program that so was very uh, specific and focused highly on uh, salmonella and um, to make sure that uh, that didn't spread and grow. Uh, from contacting any surfaces in the plant or from uh, equipment or from knives or anything like that. Um, there's a continuation of this discussion on regulatory requirements. There's antimicrobial agent and process, and uh, it may not reduce listeria monocytogenes, but it's still effective through limitation of growth organisms that survive the post uh, lethality processes. Now, one thing to keep in mind uh, when we were talking about this, and it's um, uh, kind of technical, is that uh, we want to make sure that um, not only do we have the right uh, prerequisites in place, as we mentioned earlier, that support the HASA plan, as is noted in the first paragraph here, um, but we also want to make sure that um, um, uh, we have uh, um, signed off and uh, have a backup plan uh, with product and what we're going to do with that product once uh, we find out that it's contaminated. In other words, uh, how much uh, product is retained, uh, how much uh, the product is taken off the production line, and um, and that is that is important because it shows like in a, a, a trial situation, it shows the aggressiveness that the processor took in correcting the situation, removing the contaminated meat, and getting it out of his plant and putting it into a secure location until um, we figure out what, uh, what to do in, the, in that process. Uh, we mentioned sanitation programs before. Uh, test food contact services and keep records that match some corresponding test. Um, that's a, a great idea as far as um, documenting uh, any time, any organism, uh, any along with what type of sampling program is used at the time so that when we go through and look at the, um, uh, the old procedures, we have a way of uh, sampling them and uh, verifying that that was the right um, analytical procedure to use. Cooking procedures, uh, cooking bag or cooking casing products uh, need to be monitored too for their microorganism growth. Um, since they're in bags and in a large water bath that could be 30 feet long, um, they will not get any color development. Um, which is not bad in any way, but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, may be introduced is a uh, seasoning uh, embedded into the uh, water cook bag um, so that uh, it can give it that brown uh, color. Uh, it makes it a lot more um, enticing and enjoyable to the customer that buys it. Getting close to the end of the time here, so I want to kind of slip through this. What we're doing is we're talking about different uh, 
ready to eat product interventions and diacetates is, is one, lactic acid is another. And um, uh, acidified sodium chloride, I want to let you turn this. I do want to mention on this particular uh, slide here, a very popular um, intervention method now, more and more so, is what they call a high pressure pasteurization or HPPP. Uh, it's a post-packaging uh, treatment. Uh, it's mainly used in liquid type products now, but it's becoming more widely used in the uh, in meat industry. And um, it's uh, if you want more information on it, the uh, university in the United States that is uh, at the forefront of research with uh, high pressure pasteurization is uh, Ohio State University in Columbus. And uh, I've seen their uh, their laboratory version. It's not very big. It's batch size, but uh, they're trying to get these into a continuous um, uh, process uh, flow. Uh, irradiation um, is uh, approved for use in fresh and frozen red meat products. Uh, I like to tell the story. It's um, my understanding that uh, Oma Steaks is one of the few companies that ir irradiates their uh, their beef products they send out to uh, customers, and uh, you can have 100% assurance that uh, the organisms are killed in uh, when you use the irradiation. And that's uh, reassuring to know. Um, here's a couple of documents that I cited that you can follow up with uh, in the presentation today. Uh, I like the two at the bottom, the best, the best practice for raw ground products um, by a beef organization uh, that does research on that. And then um, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Chris uh, Nath, who's a meat scientist at the Agriculture Utilization Research Institute, who gave me uh, permission to use some of her materials in here. Um, they're a nonprofit and uh, very kind to do that. Okay, that's the end. If there's any questions, I'll entertain those right now. Thanks, Daryl. If all of the um, participants can enter in the passcode, um, it is intervention. And also, um, unfortunately, we can only get to a few questions, so we will be sending the questions that were not asked over to Daryl to directly um, reply to you. So our question is, has food contamination gotten worse since, since 75 or 800 years ago before agricultural, uh, agriculture got so industrial? Um, I think quite honestly that uh, we have improved our food safety um, uh, practices and the quality of food that we eat, the safety of food that we eat. Um, the, uh, than, than we have before. Um, the United States is widely regarded for what it's doing in uh, meat safety, uh, but uh, there's a lot of leadership coming out of uh, Europe and uh, a lot of uh, some of the best processing equipment in the world is coming out of Europe, continues to be there. And um, I think what we're seeing more in the recent days or recent years has just been the, the use of uh, uh, organic acid and others to, to wash and dip the meat in, particularly in the poultry industry. Uh, that in itself has been uh, a big, a big um, success, I think. Last question. What do you believe are the best methods for employee education to promote effective utilization of interventions? Did you read that again? Sure. What do you believe are the best methods for employee education to promote effective utilization of interventions? Well, I think the best the best application is just education and um, attending uh, uh, an industry class or seminar on uh, on interventions, um, talking to uh, uh, suppliers of the products that they use for interventions. 
um, one of the least understood areas right now that uh, I think probably will grow in the future is the vaccination aspect of it. Although I know that um, uh, the food service industry, the fast food industry, uh, is very reluctant to put vaccination of any kind on their on their product, uh, but maybe there's room in other areas to uh, put microbial vaccinations um, where there's a little bit bigger success rate uh, with their application. Thanks so much, Daryl. Just, rem uh, just a reminder that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must have stayed on for the full 60 minutes of the presentation and complete the survey at the end of the program. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, SAFA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, day-in-the-life videos, research reports on expert witnesses, including the Challenge History Report 2.0 and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Daryl Suderman for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you'd like to speak with Daryl, or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding the expert witness for a case that you're working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you all for attending. This concludes our presentation for today.